Crystal. It's Crystal. Crystal. <laughs> no, sorry, who's Crystal? Yeah. Like Crystal Tips and Alistair. You're showing your age there. I am actually, aren't I? It's shocking. Right. So just be slightly careful about locking the mic or rustling papers underneath it. So. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Funk. Let's get it out of the way. <laughs> yeah. Let's everyone get their funky out of the way. Good, good, good. Hey, welcome back to the studio. We're here again for the Retail Craft Podcast. So in the studio today, we have some lovely guests. So let's kick straight off. I'm Ian Jindal, Editor-in-Chief, and... Hi, I'm Alexander Mearson. I'm Jamie Merrick from Salesforce. I'm Sian Fate from John Lewis. And Emma Herod from Internet Retailing. Wonderful. Well, look, we are so excited about today. So we've got the nation's, if not the world's, favourite retailer, represented here by uh, CN, of course. And uh, one of my favourite brand stories uh, with Alexander, who's going to chip in as well. So, CN, thank you so much for joining us. You are the director, comma, digital at John Lewis. So um, just Love tell us... Like, well, <laughs> I'm just... I'm, if there's a comma there, I have to say it. So, uh, director, comma, digital, tell us what the role encompasses. So it's quite a broad role. It includes all of product development, so across web, apps, contact centres and in-store digital. And it also includes all of the digital operations to manage that digital estate, including trading, so e-commerce. So all of the online trading management across home, fashion and electricals and the digital operations to launch and manage end-to-end the product life cycle. Wow. I'm not sure that leaves anything else for your lovely partners to do. That is an incredible uh, remit. And correct me if I'm wrong, this is a role that you took on early this year, isn't that right? Yes. So I was in the product role, digital product role, and then we decided to combine all of e-commerce into one great digital team because actually the kind of cross-functional matrix working really makes sense. It speeds up decision-making. It means you can design really great end-to-end propositions. And actually, those boundaries seemed quite artificial at the time. Mm. And, you know, we've obviously been watching John Lewis for a long time and one of the, not only the early digital pioneers, but one of the first people to really integrate the e-com into the mainstream of the business to become a true multi-channel business. Yes, yeah, so I, th- I think the, the kind of the hero thing that we did, the thing that we're famous for was click and collect. We d- certainly didn't invent click and collect, but in 2007, that decision to offer our customers great convenience by enabling them to collect their parcels in a shop really made sense to us. And actually, that was sort of the beginning of a journey of really understanding how we could connect those shopping journeys. And that's extended to today where we've provided 8,000 devices into shops for our selling floor partners to use so that they can better serve our customers using all of the incredible real-time information that they get from the application, an application that's based on our consumer iOS app. So they can check stock, they can send a customer an email if they want to make a decision later at home, as you do. Sometimes you have to ask your significant other if you you know, really can spend another £1,500 on a MacBook. But also provide advice and guidance along the way without ever having to leave the side of the customer. So it's their best blend of human and digital within a great shop environment. And it means they can really build a relationship with the customer. So actually, digital isn't taking our partners away from customers. If anything, it's helping them to create an even deeper bond. And so would you say that's been the driver behind the multi-channel developments, that uh, bond to the customer? I think so. And we always say, you know, for us, it is personal We're a partner-based business. We're a co-owned business. Our partners in a shop um, aren't paid commission. They are owners of the business. They have a vested interest in building a relationship with customers, offering impartial advice and guidance. So I think it's, it's how do we enable those relationships to form? And actually, if you have a look at what's happening in retail and the purpose of physical retail, it is very much about... That physical presence is about advice, guidance. It's about sensing things, seeing things, trying things. And more and more, we think that is the 
the value that we add. That's what's special about us. And it's what, you know, the extra value that our partners can offer to our customers. Mm. But as um, digital has spread throughout the business, what have those challenges been, if any, to get that adoption? I'm, I'm minded of a previous MD we interviewed uh, many years ago, and uh, he was saying that when he first started on the direct business, partner meetings, he'd be asked, why are you spending so much money on e-com? And he remembers one meeting where the question was, why aren't you spending more on e-com? Because it's driving so much in store. So there was a switching point there, you know, maybe six, seven, eight years ago. But now as everybody in store has to be digital and offline and customer focused and knowledge about the product and mindful of the environment, there's a lot for, you know, store colleagues to cover. I mean, is this an easy path or are there challenges that uh, you're finding as, as you grow this out? I think the, the temptation is is to view partners and shoppers being some kind of slaves to their robot overlords. And that is absolutely not what we want to deliver. And in fact, I think our approach to how we went about really looking at great experiences was quite different. So when we first thought about this, and it actually was a suggestion from partners saying, our customers are walking into our shops with mobile phones and we don't feel as though we are empowered to have the same conversation because at that point, our partners couldn't have their own personal devices on the shop floor. So normally you would you would probably just go and provide some form of uh, interface to those partners and, and that would be that. But we actually went about it in a, a very different way. We put our UX research team into our Cambridge shop and asked them to live with those partners for a week to follow them and ask questions like, why are you doing that? Why are you writing that down on a piece of paper? Timing how long it took to go to the stockroom, how long they were away from the customer side, and actually asking them questions about what they felt would be the most useful things that they could do on a device. And even down to form factor, you know, how big should this device be? We tried all sorts of different sizes, all different brands of mobile device. And that made a real difference because it felt like what we created bubbled up from the needs of those partners and from the needs of their working lives and extend that out to today where there is a continual feedback cycle. And that's done a couple of things. It's got real buy-in. So we, we didn't have that kind of usual kind of um, training program that has to accompany a rollout. So we were able to roll out really quickly. So from from first getting approval from the board who thought this was a good idea, but they weren't quite sure how quickly or how much value we would add to being live in the shop took 90 days. And then it took us a year to roll out mm. to all partners on the selling floor, all those thousands of devices, which is really speedy. And I think we were able to get that pace because we had real buy-in. It was a really joined up team and people could see the immediate benefits and could also understand their part in requesting further functionality. It is very much part of their working lives, as opposed to being something additional to their working lives. Mm. Does the ownership structure, does that really make the difference compared to other places perhaps that you've worked in terms of adoption of all this stuff, you know, to make customers' lives better? Because in other places, sometimes there can be a bit of conflict, can't there, between the channels? I think being a partnership makes a huge difference. It allows us to make decisions because what we choose to invest in is, is effectively our own choice. It is not something that a shareholder is going to have a say on. We are very collaborative and actually probably relatively small and all in one kind of building as well. And it's quite easy to gain access to the other parts of the estate where needed. So I think that makes a huge difference and also because partners can see the benefit to our customer base but also to the partnership as a whole and that that is the guiding light that you know we are there to really keep the partnership going for future generations we are not there necessarily for profit immediately now <coughs> um, and one of the, the first principle is happiness the happiness of our partners in a successful business so I think that makes a huge difference and it allows us to do things like design things that are going to be great to use or easy to use. Whereas I think some of those decisions, if you were purely looking at it from a shareholder perspective, might not be that easy to prioritise. <laughs> right. Quite. So you talked about the UX team with the store. 
But your activity <clears throat> has actually spanned many silos, you know, with its operations, uh, store operations, technology, merchandising. How do you go about working across function and silos within the organization? I think it's it's just that. I think those what appear to be silos are really just groupings of people around similar capabilities. But in any initiative, the way we work is in, in cross-functional teams and we get everyone together at the start to agree what are the outcomes that we're seeking to achieve, how are we going to prioritise those, how are we going to measure them together, and then through the life of delivering something, that cross-functional stakeholder team works together through the life of a programme. It isn't just a handoff where someone says, thank you very much, CN, please go and build us some of that. Mm. They are very much part of that. So, for example, with personal styling, we provided a clienteling application onto the device just for our personal stylists. And that's been the fashion team, it's been the customer experience team, it's been the personal stylists themselves, really working together, some of the store managers, understanding what that's going to look like as part of the workday and customers giving us feedback on prototypes and going through personal styling experiences. So that feels like a much better way of working. Some people say, well, surely that takes time. But actually getting all that upfront alignment means you can go faster because you're not stopping to kind of re-explain why you're doing something. You've got that deep alignment right from the start and a continued discussion around what's important through the life of any delivery. Now, you say important... Listening to you is interesting because I can hear what used to be two roles. One would be the product development role, make me something shiny and deliver it, but also the trading side. So to what extent do you think that having both the commercial reins and KPIs and the product influences either side? So do you sense yourself? Are you more demanding of product? Is the product better because of the commerce? How do those two fit together? I think they're, they're constantly in balance with each other in a sort of lovely yin-yang way. <laughs> um, and I think it starts with the customer and it absolutely has to, you know, that is our North Star, is, is making sure that, that it is something that is meaningful to a customer. It really solves a problem for the customer or delights a customer. And if we have happy customers who, who are feeling fulfilled, that's that's a great start. However whatever we work on needs to be commercially viable. It needs to return for us so that we can continue to operate and we can continue to invest in our customers. And I think we're allowed to prioritise in any given moment on one of those kind of delightful sides. So sometimes we, we will prioritise something because it makes something more efficient and saves time and therefore resource of some kind. And sometimes we will prioritise on the love factor, because actually, as a brand, trust and love are so important to us, we'll over-index on them. So I think being able to hold those two realities together in any decision-making process is really important. Mm. I'm just wondering what the KPI for love might be and <laughs> uh, how do you measure it. Maybe that's uh, something that uh, our listener can email us and tell us. So in this lovely yin-yang world of balance, of love, of efficiency, the, the other pressure we have in our businesses to keep innovating and keep changing. So even as you're doing all of these projects, do you feel that um, pressure to up the pace of change? And if so, how do you manage an innovation change program? I think that pressure is always there. Our customers are so demanding and they will always be way ahead of you in terms of what they design. They, they, they see no difference between John Lewis, the, the very large retailer and this cool startup, this app that they're using. And they want it all and they bounce seamlessly from experience to experience. So they'll go from Airbnb to shopping for a dress and expect the same level of service. So for us, I think that innovation is a real pressure, but it's also an excitement. If you think about my team and what fires them up, it's being able to do interesting new things that they think will be of benefit. And ideas come from everywhere. They can come from our contact centers. We get letters all the time about how could we make this better or I've seen something or I've had an idea. And we always try to realize those. We also have John Lewis Ventures, which is looking further on sort of on the outer fringes of new possibilities um, for John Lewis. So we've just purchased Open which underpins our ability to provide services at scale to our customers. 
So alongside products, we'd have services. And we think that's a really great fit. And then we also have um, JLab, which is a great way for us to engage with people who have great ideas, who need advice and guidance from a large retailer and all of the support we can offer them. But also we get incredible amounts of oxygen and, you know, sort of just ideas and spark from um, all of the, the various startups that we engage with. Mm, interesting. What, what, if any, are the challenges of working with startups when, you know, there's this asynchronous level of, of scale, for example, or expectation and, you know, they have point solutions where you're dealing with an end-to-end -end service. How are you finding going from the lab environment to a deployed environment? It is a challenge. And sometimes we'll incubate things for a longer period of time to give them that opportunity to be hot hours. So if I think about some of the things we're doing with Waitrose and in-home delivery and some of the sort of more experimental parts of really trying to understand how we can expand our offer, the temptation always is to find something exciting and try and integrate it into the core. But actually, we, we've given it the opportunity to kind of grow on the side. I think also... We are working on our kind of core digital foundation to, to make sure that actually integration can be easy and light rather than quite complicated. So moving to, to APIs on the front end, moving to microservices on our back end will enable us to, to integrate things in a much more seamless way uh, once the technology has been deemed to be robust and once we've tested with customers and tested operationally. Mm. Um, how we can run and manage whatever new initiative it is. Great. So let's, let's think new. We have Black Five Day behind us. Peak will soon be over. 2019 is a lovely green valley full of opportunity. Mm. Uh, what's exciting you for next year? What are you going to do that you just go home and think, God, I just love my job. I'm so excited about X. What What is that X? I think there are possibly two X's. The, the first is absolutely getting under the skin of how we can make the physical shopping environment more exciting and more of an experience for our customers. And that's leveraging digital, but in, in different ways, both for partners, but also for customers and making shops more of an experience, but also far more intelligent the other element that excites me is, is what we can do with visualization. So really helping customers to see things, to experience things when they're shopping online. And I think that CGI and AR have come quite a long way. And they, they haven't really kind of been used at scale. But I think actually with powerful phones and great technology and Wi-Fi everywhere, there's a lot more that we could do to bring products to life for customers. So if we go back to the first X and uh, shops, so even though I make my living in shopping, there are times I just, you know, I'm just sick of shops. I like product, but sometimes I just don't want to go in the shop. So what is this new shopping experience you're going to bring to life? Could you give us a for instance so we can uh, whet our appetites with that? I think it's that powerful blend of seeing physical products and being able to to really experiencing them. So if you think about if you're shopping for a sofa, you really do need to see some things in person and sit on them and try them and understand, you know, all of your options as well as all of the fabrics and the feel of those fabrics. But we need to make that quite kind of a, a rich experience as well in terms of being able to flick through loads of different colour swatches because people are really bad at visualising things, or to connect that to a later purchase or to understand the narrative, the story of that product better mm -hmm. and to connect it to all of the other things that you could have, how you could style it. And I think though that's the opportunity for us to connect an in-the-moment physical product to all of the other things that sit around it. Yes, and, and we're seeing this a lot with the brands that we're tracking, how the brand story, the uh, details of the materials used, where it was made, provenance, environmental impact, you know, user stories, all of these now need to be brought to a point of experience because the customer hasn't got time to go to the library or find a magazine to do that. Very interesting. On the experience point, I saw in some press this week or recently about a beauty bar type uh, thing in Cambridge, I think it was. Yes, beauty concierge. Beauty concierge, which sounds very interesting because it's a <laughs> world I don't understand. So probably good for me to go and spend some time there. But anyway, so do you feel like you need to connect 
that experience to the digital version of it? Or do you kind of run these projects separately? Do you see what I mean? Uh, how do you do it? We always try and connect them where possible. Sometimes the physical leads and then the digital follows and sometimes digital leads and physical follows. In that particular experience, if you think about the sort of beauty halls, you can be overwhelmed with choice. And if mm. you're trying to find the perfect foundation for your skin, it might mean that you need to visit three or four <clears throat> different beauty brands. And actually with a beauty consultant, a John Lewis beauty consultant, she could actually do that for you and then also show you how to apply it and introduce you to other products that are complementary, not necessarily from the same brand. But in that kind of experience, in a in a 15-minute or a 45-minute consultation, you might see and hear all so- about all sorts of products and forget them quite easily. Mm. So how do we connect that? How do we connect the tutorial? How do we connect all of the the sort of um, the editorial stuff that's really important to know to that experience for later consumption mm. and so you can remember things? Uh, and I think that that's where the balance is really quite great. Mm. And um, I guess some categories are, lend themselves better to that than others. Would that be fair to say? Yeah, I, I think it's the degree to which you need advice and guidance and uh, and help on how to get the look as well as the ability to put things together or to remember them for later. So, mm. you know, creating a sort of a, a consideration list as well. Yes. And also with, you know, products you've bought, uh, I saw to someone the other day and they were saying that the most asked question for the technology they sell was, what does the blue light mean? <laughs> and so, you know, it's moving from beyond just a purchase to living with the product, enjoying the product and moving into service as well. So very, very interesting. Good. Well, look, Sian, thank you so much for that. We're going to swap now from multi-category, multi-location to the man, the legend, the brand, Alex Mearson. I, I was going to try <laughs> pressure at all. and summarise, but I, I've just given up. Can you just explain your business? First of all, I thought what you were talking about was very interesting. I'd like to go back to that concept of the beauty concierge because it's very close to um, something I'm trying to develop here. So Mearson is the watch brand that I have founded mm, now almost 10 years ago and presented my first watch collections in 2014 in London. So um, as you can hear it, I'm deeply British. (laughs) 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 So um, I moved from my homeland, France, to to Britain uh, in 2005, and this is where I founded my brand. But definitely, the more I look at it, Britain helped me create it, but it's definitely French. The the purpose of, of Mearson is to design and manufacture hopefully beautiful timepieces that are um, handmade and made to order for each of our clients. We've launched new collections every year and uh, meet every single of our clients. And now the question is, how can we scale? How can we grow? And uh, it's, it's a very exciting time for us. You know, a lot of the product development we see these days is either technologically led or material led, whereas I think it's Quite interesting that, you know, you have a maison, it's the design, it's everything from the styling, the the artistry, the man, new manufacturing techniques linked with, you know, old crafts all coming together with a very personal touch. I mean, it's quite an extraordinary thing to see that level of craft <clears throat> and luxury. It's true. Um, first of all, I'm a designer. So that's my my craft, if you can, if you can use that word for that. And everything starts with... A drawing. I, I, I use my pencil and I design from A to Z every component of, of, of the timepiece. And I spend as much time on the silhouette, which I pursue, uh, desperately trying to uh, dig in at every collection to express that silhouette. And I spend as much time on this as on the, the materiality of the strap, the shape of every lug, and the um, the design of the movement and every component. So there's no hierarchy between the different components in the watch. And I'm not extremely conservative. I celebrate craft, but for me, craft is a job well done. And I found that the land of watchmaking uh, can be found in Japan, in in Switzerland, and I chose Switzerland to, to kick off. But to your point about technology, what makes us maybe a little bit different to others is that we don't start from the mechanical movement, which is extremely complex and sophisticated in our case. 
the first thing is the silhouette. So it's style. And so we are a designer-led brand, which makes us a very rare breed at that uh, level of craft indeed, because each watch involves between 60 and 90 artisans. And it goes from hand to hand and can take up to six to eight months to, to make one piece. Uh, some are much simpler to execute, but they all go through the same process. So yes, uh, I control the design. It's not controlled by technology or what has been done in the past. And this is also what uh, makes um, our friends in Switzerland scratch their heads very often <laughs> when I visit them. So, well, that's not how we do things, but that's how we're going to do them now. <laughs> so, <laughs> it's, it's, uh, but one of the other things you do uniquely, I thought, was while you have this artistic design process, your customer acquisition, maintenance, development, relationship it is extraordinary. And I used to say that you were the first luxury brand I knew that had been started on social. Uh, not strictly true, but, you know, you're 24 hours a day in with holding yes. hands with, engaged with your customers all around the world. So just tell me how, mm. you know, you have this creative process on the one hand and this literally one-to-one -one relationship with customers. How did social help there or was social just... Uh, you know, window on it. At the root of the foundation of the house, as I call it, is the, this concept of maison, which is a French word that you can understand as a house. For a French person, it means much more than that. It's, um, it's the place where the designer meets the clients and meets the artisans. And this, I don't know if it's symbiotic or if it's uh, an alchemy that happens is the magic and the mystery of creation. And I will always remember, and I try to celebrate the maison of my youth that I've, I've known uh, since I was born, where the designer would meet the clients and, and communicate constantly. And, I'm, and for me, the internet is not the mass media that people project, it is only. I think it's extremely tribal, it's extremely individual, and it's probably the best way today to engage in one-to-one -one communications with people around the world. Also, probably because we have not spent money uh, in marketing and we, were, we didn't have the luxury to decide we would advertise or uh, open stores. So we use also a weakness as a, as a strength, I guess. And my own experience with social media and, and digital marketing for luxury brands has helped a lot. I found immediately on Facebook and more on LinkedIn and Instagram, a place where I could really be myself and share the story that uh, I was building and engaging with uh, people who wrote to me or communicated. And it's it, I learned a lot. Uh, for instance, I, I don't look at the likes that much because I discovered that people who know the more, more about my brand are people who never like or comment. It's, it's very, very interesting to see how people then contact you out of the blue and say, oh, I've been seeing this for the last few weeks. I noticed you said you were tired when you traveled there. How are you? I said, okay, I'm, I'm great. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, thanks for asking. And um, uh, talking about the new collections or new creations or bespoke work we do and in new launches. And there's a lot of communication. It's, it's, it's incredible. Uh, it's really, really, really um, but that, fascinating. But that communication is one-to-one -one and private, mm -hmm. yet viewed by a large sort no. of fan base. You have this duality between the actual personal <laughs> and then the amplified jet setting and so, wearing. There is a part of those comments that are happening on the on the walls or on on on, on the posts, but I would say that's the visible aspect of the of the iceberg. Most communication happened with direct messages or WhatsApp or WeChat a lot, and. It's my job to maintain this relationship because it's it's inspiring, it's extremely encouraging, it teaches me a lot, but it's also the raison d'être, as we say, of, of, of the brand. But I think one of the reasons why it may work is because I've started the brand with a very important decision at the beginning, which was not to follow rules, but to try to stick to values. You mentioned the values of, of John Lewis, pleasure, Pleasure is very important for us. Uh, we have three main values, which are integrity, boldness, and pleasure. What does it mean? It means that we don't say things which are not true, and we do what we say. 
So we're very comfortable in sharing information. So there's no um, bad question or no risk in, in saying anything because we are not afraid to, to, to share uh, knowledge. It doesn't hurt us in any way. Boldness is in the audacity maybe of mixing certain materials or working, uh, envisaging using new technology in our, in our world, which is extremely conservative, uh, designing out of Switzerland, Swiss watches, and designing them with people around the world or for people around the world. And pleasure, because I designed for that. Uh, I want people to have an incredible experience, not only before or during or, or after their purchase. I want them to enjoy them when they're in a meeting and they're touching the, the side of the watch, which is sharp by design so that it can, you know, be relaxing or, or touching the, a curve that is special. And they tell me, oh, I've discovered that this design feature is, is new. I hadn't noticed it. So the pleasure continues afterwards. Mm. And um, that's important. So when we first met, you were already uh, highly regarded as a luxury consultant, helping <laughs> brands connect their products with the global luxury consumer. Now you're doing it yourself. What have you learned that maybe you didn't know before or that's become more evident to you as you spend more time one-to-one -one with these with your customers? Hmm, that's a very good question. I became um, a consultant to allow me to build my brand and also because very early on in the shop floor at my father's shop, we had one of the first Apple computers and I had brought it to the shop to show clients certain information. So this was something that was really important to me, the screen and the and the in-store experience was always something that fascinated me. I think doing things myself now and for myself confirms a few things. Um, hard work. Nothing is magical. Nothing uh, comes out of the blue. And you will never get things done without briefing them properly. And someone else than you will never do it unless you explain properly what you expect. So I often see that in the businesses that I have had the honor to support and a company the, one of the first things that i've learned was you know you want to do something make the effort to really express what is the outcome you're expecting why you're doing it and who you are don't think that by delegating to someone else or a, an agency they will do better than you no you need you need to do a, to be a good client and to be a good professional you have to be extremely professional yourself mm -hmm. i think that's the first the first learning the second is numbers. Numbers talk. So you need to learn about them. You need to understand a PNL and, and all the traffic drivers, understand what's conversion, what conversion means or doesn't mean. You have to listen to numbers and you have to listen to your customers. Now, I believe that's pretty generic and maybe boring, but everything at the end of the day is common sense, respect for your customer and integrity. And many of the turnarounds that I have observed and successes I have seen have come from the fact that someone decided to sit down and work very hard <laughs> rather than move their hands in all directions. Yeah. Um, Interesting. Now, we're uh, just working on our luxury sector report. Mm. And the ones that bubble up to the top and are globally known you know, they're facias, they have vast marketing budgets, uh, production facilities around the world. Yet contrast that with craft, luxury, atelier, maison, the 1950s in mm. Paris, which is sort of what you're evoking for us. Now that you are creating your own products face-to-face -face with your own customer, has that changed what you think the definition of luxury might be? Because it's, it's, it's such an overused word. Now, every brand says they're luxury here, luxury there. Uh, what, what does luxury actually mean? Help me with a definition. There, there's not one definition, I, I suppose. That's an easy answer. But for me, purchasing or, or experiencing a, product, a luxury product is getting close to creation. So the, I would say the first difference between a luxury product and without being derogatory of a mass market product is that the... No one is waiting for a luxury product and no one wants it before it's created. 
And it, it's the job of the creator to dig in constantly and try to bring to the world something that will create a desire, that will create a connection. So the first element of luxury for me is connection. It's the connection between the owner and the maker through that product that becomes extremely meaningful to them. So connection, meaning either because the narrative around the product is now more important than the product itself in a way. How I got to choose it, how I got to receive it or to mm. purchase it, how it was made by whom. That's extremely, so the connection, the narrative, the emotion that goes with it, the craft, it's well done. It's something that I, it's a keepsake. It's something that I can transmit or give later to someone else. Mm -hmm. And at last, it's pleasure, pleasure, pleasure. Uh, the pleasure and purpose. I buy something that has a purpose that's fit for that purpose. You could say a phone is fit for purpose, is the luxury item, but it's the blend of all of that. All right. The feeling connected, not only with an artist or a designer, but with your time and your place a community, potentially, and the fact that it is well done and not necessarily, it's exclusive in the sense that it's not excluding others, but it is something that's um, exceptional. I love that, exceptional. Exactly. Mm -hmm. um, if I can ask, I mean, you mentioned WeChat. It sounds like you have quite a few Chinese customers. So are they finding you when they come over or are you going out to get them? And also, second part of question, sorry, is the way in which you just described the luxury, is that the way that they're perceiving the brand? When I presented my first collection, I had, to be completely honest, no idea how I would bring it to market. Mm -hmm. So it was a, a luxury in itself to be able to go on that journey and produce that and put it on the table and show it to people. And by presenting my first collection, I immediately connected with people who liked it or not mm. and this created a sense of community mm. and i've discovered on the internet people were following and quite actively excited about what i was doing because it seemed to resonate with them and the beauty of that is people travel a lot mm. and i travel a lot so i have found that many chinese uh, people i've had in, i have interacted with were extremely refined and sophisticated and delighted to find uh, something that they had not seen elsewhere and that corresponded to a certain style that they liked. Mm. So I think there's no such thing as the Chinese customer, the American mm. customer. There are worlds with big differences mm -hmm. in, in cultures and, and life. But when you do something well and when you execute it well or at the best you can and you try to put some of your heart in it, you connect with other hearts. And God knows there are many Chinese, so a few of them have connected. <laughs> now, how did we meet? Purely through, interact through owners first. So I have right. an owner who uh, ordered a watch in London, traveled to Singapore, then went to live in China. He met people in China and they uh, connected with me and I started to interact with them. So it's still very small. We haven't set a foothold in China. We are just interacting with people. I started a creative project with Chinese artists working on um, on an exhibit for 2020 of art pieces that correspond in the sense that they communicate with art pieces. So it's a it's a project I have which is purely creative and artistic, which is a, a great mm. way to get in, in the market. Amazing. So you're jetting around the world. Your team is growing. I think it's what, six people now? Yeah. yeah. How do you scale? Do you want to scale? How do you become so the the big the next, um, you know, major global brand if that's what you want? But I mean, it, it's so tied to you, your value so far. Even if you're going to brief everyone really, really well, of course. Uh, how how does the scaling work? So, the question that happened uh, a few weeks ago was: Do we want to be an amazing bespoke service that goes around the world and creates timepieces like we do at the moment for? owners of beautiful arts or houses and stuff, or do we want to become a brand? And we want to become a brand. And that's the clear, clear answer. That means what, that... What does that mean? It means that I have, I want to now reach out to a wider audience uh, 
and I need to do the hard work at defining exactly who we are and what we are so that it can be shared by others than me and I can have my role of creative director, as they say, uh, of the brand and focus m even more on the design and the development of new collections, uh, creations that are updated regularly and animated and gain support from others to respond to clients. Uh, we are but not limited to watches in that case. Well, already watches is, is the the only marketing investment we've ever made was on the China ink that would print the logo on the <laughs> on the dials, and one sentence which I wrote, which is maison de style et d'horlogerie, which is house of style and watchmaking. But watchmaking is our root. But it's more designing time pieces. They not necessarily on your wrist to give you a hint of what we're preparing. Um, <laughs> but uh, what is really uh, important is that the concept of the brand, to move from a name to a brand, we need to scale to a certain level without losing that direct relationship with our consumers and, and customers and friends. So my ambition is not to uh, grow a, a gigantic multinational if it means losing this direct connection and creating brand departments that cut that that relationship. But do you think there's a finite size, though, that the company can become without diluting your vision? I don't know how to quantify that, but I would say at the moment, I know every client. Even those who order their piece online, at some point we have a conversation. It's my pleasure, but it maybe needs to be now rarer or not systematic. So I accept that it may have to change in a, in a way, but I want to maintain a direct communication with the customer. So I would say uh, the first element is keeping control on distribution. So I think that in the world of retail today, and that's a lesson I've learned, retailers do not sell what clients don't buy from them. And with all respect, I don't know the world of John Lewis, but when I've met retailers, they all told me, we would like to stock you when people ask for you. So they have lost their mission, which initially I believe was also to find new products and introduce them to clients. Mm -hmm. And in our current world, and in particular in the watch world, which is dominated by three or four groups, it's very difficult to find your space. So my lesson from there that made me think a lot was, okay, then we would like to maintain this relationship and maybe open our own stores, our own showrooms, our own experiential spaces where we will maintain. So the size may be limited by our capacity to sell directly. I'm saying this, but I would like our watches to continue to be displayed in places which are not watch shops, like luxury department stores, concept stores, as they're called sometimes, places of luxury and fashion, which are quite uh, working quite well. But in terms of size, I think we need to limit intermediaries so that will cap probably mm -hmm. our our size. Well, I'm sure given the combination of talent and ambition, it won't be uh, too much of a limit. And, you know, we wish you well, but also thanks for your openness uh, in sharing, not just today, but, you know, we should say you've been a great resource to us uh, with insight and advice on Thank a you. number of things. No, so it's great to have a chance to chat uh, openly. And also, you know, bring it back as you've done to the customer, to product integrity. And as we're hearing from CN about having as well the uh, organizational integrity around you know, the partners, their involvement. So I think we should just file this as, um, you know, just a love podcast. <laughs> well, but that's, that's, thank you very much. I, yeah. You mentioned the big brands and, and what I've learned. And, you know, I'm, I'm slow. Sometimes I, I, <laughs> I need to, a long time to be quick. <laughs> so one of the things I've learned, which I think are, are interesting within big groups, is the media buying side. I've discovered how bigger the companies are, the bigger they rely on media buying giants that make the client, the, uh, the business, much more remote from the consumer. And I've discovered recently with a, a high-end luxury client, retailer, how bringing back media buy online, in-house, has multiplied the ROI significantly. Mm. 
Mm. And I think it's it's uh, it went for a big conversation. It's a big learning. All the debates around growth hacking, uh, real time bidding, all these uh, things. One thing I've learned is when you run your own business, how money is wasted in uh, big organizations. On that note, blending creativity and financial common sense, we're going to leave you from the love in the studio, uh, Alex, Jamie, CN, Emma, thank you all so much. Until our next episode, may the love be with you all. <laughs> we love you. <laughs> Lots of love. Lots of love. Love everywhere. And you said you weren't very English. Then he said, oh, gosh. Yeah. <laughs> that was the most English thing anyone else said in the yes. room. <laughs> in the basil. That was great. I feel inspired now. Did you steal my pen? Oh, I, I borrowed your pen. There's no, there's no love now, is there? There's You're definitely no love now. No, I have to go back to business now. Yes, yes exactly. <laughs>